Mary Mogulesti um, was a recent psychology graduate from Northwestern University, is beginning her master's in social work at Columbia, and she hopes to be a counselor and an activist when she grows up. She did PR for NUSSA and directed programming for SHAPE, sexual health and assault peer educators at an NU student group that educates the campus about everything sexual. She also writes for Free Thought Blogs, advocates for better, wow, I speak for a living, that's hard to imagine, advocates for better mental health services and occasionally sleeps. Please welcome Mary Mogulowski. Hello, thank you for the warm welcome. To start off, I need a volunteer. Wow, um, how about you? Exactly. <laughs> Come on up, stand right here. This is your heart. You only get one, and you have to take good care of it. Now, say you meet a nice boy, and you really like him, and you start dating. Now, you know that you need to save yourself from marriage, but you just can't wait, and you have sex with him. You have to rip off part of the heart. <laughs> Your perspective would buy left species. <laughs> so you're teenagers, so the relationship breaks up. And you meet another boy and you start dating. And you have sex with him. Rip off another part of the heart. I don't need a And now you're older, and you meet the man of your dreams who you want to marry and have children with and spend the rest of your life with. And this is all you have left of your heart to give him. Have a seat, please. <laughs> that was an example of abstinence-only sex education. That's how I learned about sex in public school in fifth grade, about an hour west of here. I turned out okay. But as you'll see, this is not any way to teach sex to children. Abstinence-only sex education basically means that you're teaching that you should abstain from sex before marriage, and that's the gold standard of human relationships. Um, it does not necessarily teach any information about birth control and contraception. Abstinence is touted as the only truly effective way to stay safe and avoid pregnancy. The definition of abstinence-only sex ed largely comes from the requirements for federal funding, which is how states get money for these programs. There are several components to that definition. A few of them include, as I said, must promote abstinence as the only way to avoid pregnancy and STIs, must teach that monogamous marital relationships are the expected standard, must teach that extramarital and premarital sex have harmful psychological and physical consequences. It must teach that having children out of wedlock has negative consequences for everyone involved. And it also teaches how to reject sexual advances, because that's going to be pretty important if you're not going to be having sex for a while. As I mentioned, these programs are often federally funded. The federal government funds both abstinence-only and comprehensive sex ed, which I'll discuss in a moment, through grants to states. In 2010, Congress finally eliminated $112 million in abstinence-only funding and added $155 million in comprehensive sex ed funding. However, $50 million in abstinence-only funding still remains, and that's $50 million too much. Um, and I just wanted to add, it's a, it's a good sign that the funding is decreasing, um, but unfortunately some areas are getting even more conservative in terms of what they teach, as we'll cover in a moment. So states also have individual regulations about sex education. For instance, 22 states actually require sex education in schools, and 20 of those require that that include HIV AIDS education. However, only 19 states require sex ed to be scientifically accurate. <laughs> That's the problem. Also, 35 states and, and the District of Columbia allow parents to opt their children out of sex ed entirely. Um, as you'll see, that's more states than actually require sex education. So in some states, schools don't have to provide it. But if they do, parents are allowed to opt their children out. So abstinence-only education is wrong. First of all, it doesn't work. Oops. <laughs> Most of these programs do not delay sexual initiation, which is the age when you first have sex. They show no positive changes in sexual behavior, which includes uh, using contraception. Um, also, some of them actively make things worse. For instance, virginity pledge programs, which include having teenagers sign a pledge to not have sex before they get married, or they wear a 
a special ring, that's like a purity ring, those actually make things worse. Um, teams who pledge, uh, who sign these pledges are no less likely to have sex than those who don't, and they're actually less likely to use contraception. Also, it's medically inaccurate. A study showed that 80% of the most popular abstinence-only programs actually distort scientific facts. And that doesn't mean that they outright lie, but that means that they use various techniques to kind of skew the truth. For instance, they'll say, well, abstinence is the only way to be absolutely sure you won't get pregnant. I mean, I suppose that's true, but condoms are also pretty effective. Um, <laughs> They, they, so they often misrepresent the effectiveness of condoms. Um, sometimes they'll claim that they're much less effective than they actually are. Sometimes they'll just completely lie and say that AIDS can get through condoms somehow. I don't know. Um, they often claim that premarital sex, abortion, and so on are associated with... Sorry? I don't even know how to respond to that, no. <laughs> um, so they often teach that uh, stuff like premarital, premarital sex, abortion, and so on have uh, harmful physical and psychological consequences that there is no evidence for. Um, and one of the most dangerous things is that they often appropriate scientific language to kind of lend themselves false credibility. Um, and that's really dangerous because it makes people believe that there's like scientific evidence behind this when there's not necessarily. Um, and one example of that is they often teach that a hormone called oxytocin is released in a woman's brain, only in a woman's, uh, when she has sex with a man, um, and it makes her bond to the man for good. So because men only ever want casual sex, the women have their hearts broken inevitably because this hormone got released and bonded into the man. Um, and some even extend this to say that, like, if this happens too many times, the woman then loses her ability to release oxytocin, so then she can't get married uh, because she's never going never gonna to bond with anyone ever again. Um, and that, as you can see, that was sort of the premise behind the activity that we started out with. Uh, the idea that if you have uh, sex before marriage too many times, you will no longer be, you will be damaged goods. You will not be able to love anyone truly ever again. Um, in fact, the science of oxytocin is very complicated, and I don't know it very well because I'm not a neurobiologist. Um, but what we do know is that it's released in people of all genders. It's released during all sorts of pleasurable activities, not just uh, sex or touching, but also singing in groups or playing petting animals. Um, you know, hugging people, talking intimately with friends also releases oxytocin. It's associated with building trust, and it's especially important during times of stress, which might be why it's important to de-stress when you are stressed. Um, there doesn't appear to be any scientific evidence that it causes women to become permanently heartbreakingly attached to their casual sex partners. Furthermore, Oh, sorry. Um, this is just an example of one of the falsehoods that they teach, and this happened, like, literally just now. Um, North Carolina approved a bill that uh, requires middle school teachers to teach that having an abortion later will increase your chances of preterm birth. That's not true. Another example, also very recently, was in Tennessee. They had an abstinence assembly that used all sorts of scare tactics about STIs spreading despite condoms. Uh, and the most, the most terrible thing about this is that they actually interviewed uh, the school representative, and he said something like, yes, you know, it's unfortunate that this happened. We had no idea that this was going on. However, we would hope that our students are able to separate back from fiction. <laughs> Only sex education is based on religion. Um, this is often a little indirect because it would be much more of a constitutional challenge to openly preach religion in a classroom, although I'm sure that it happens. Um, but it's, it's more of a subtle thing. So these programs are very centered on virginity, you know, like the virginity pledges and the purity rings and being virgin to marriage. These are religious concepts. Uh, virginity doesn't have much of a medical basis for it. Um, they also, it's important to look at who supports these programs. It tends to be religious conservative politicians and churches. Uh, churches often have these programs, they sometimes receive federal funding for them as well. Um, and also these programs, they, they, their emphasis on marriage and monogamy and heterosexuality uh, sort of explicitly has a religious basis because there's no scientific evidence that, you know, only married sex is safe sex. You can get STIs, you know, even when you're married. You can get accidentally pregnant even when you're married. Um, and yet that they maintain this standard that marriage is, you know, the one true way to have healthy sex. Another problem is that it leaves out a lot of important information, like most of the important information. 
Um, See, other than the fact that STIs are a thing and abstinence does help prevent them, it pretty much leaves out everything about actually preventing them. It doesn't really discuss safer sex, and when it does, it misrepresents how well it works. Um, they might mention condoms, but they never talk about dental dams, female condoms, hormonal birth control, IUDs, uh, because that would be bad. Uh, the, it doesn't emphasize consent and talk about the ways in which sexual assault can actually be prevented, that is, by getting clear consent from your partners. Um, and in fact, by framing all sex as just bad and dirty, it kind of hides a distinction between consensual and non-consensual sex, because in any case, it's bad. Um, it doesn't teach teens how to communicate openly with their partners about sex and relationships, and it doesn't teach them that talking openly about sex is a good thing. The only communication skills that it teaches are just say no, which isn't really the best way of uh, thinking about sexual communication, because saying yes is also important. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily uh, teach about reproductive health in general, except for STIs, um, you know, how to prevent yeast infections when you need to get a pap smear. Um, and those are important things for people to know about their bodies. And obviously the existence of non-heterosexual, non-cisgender people is never even acknowledged, um, which I guess is a little better than framing it as awful and sinful. Um, and not only does this ma make LGBTQ teens feel like their experiences don't matter, but it also keeps them from learning important information about their own health and about issues affecting their communities. Uh, further, it teaches harmful myths about sex and sexuality. It teaches that sex is shameful and dirty, especially for women. It teaches that sex outside of monogamous marriage is miserable and dangerous. It teaches that there's only one soulmate out there for you, and you must be abstinent until you meet that soulmate and get married. Uh, it teaches a sort of adversarial model of relationships, that is, men will try to get sex from women, and women have to keep themselves from giving sex to men who want to take it. That's not really how healthy relationships should work. <laughs> And it teaches that traditional gender roles are healthy, um, and it does this by sort of implicitly confirming them, like the fact that men will be the ones who pursue and women will be the ones who are pursued. By teaching this as a normative um, and acceptable model of relationships, it teaches that these gender roles are a good way to live your life. Um, and it, they don't necessarily come right out and say any of these things in the classroom. But these myths are implied by the model of sex and relationships that's being taught. For instance, you know, again, if girls are taught that guys will try to get sex from them and they have to not give it, what does that say about women's own sexual needs? Do they even have any? So an alternative that is rapidly gaining ground is comprehensive sex education. It is generally, it's medically accurate and it's uh, meant to be age appropriate. It teaches about STIs, HIV, AIDS, contraception and birth control, also abstinence, relationship for productive anatomy, and so on. The focus is on delaying sexual initiation, so, um, you know, encouraging teens to wait until later to have sex, and also reducing risky sexual behaviors. So to them, that means anything like, you know, not using protection or having sex with many people. Does it work? Yes. Um, teens who have uh, comprehensive sex ed are 50% less likely to become pregnant accidentally than teens who have absence-only sex education. Many of these programs also increase contraceptive use, reduce the number of sexual partners that teens have, delay sexual initiation, reduce STI incidence, and reduce the frequency of sex. So it does fall short in several ways. First of all, as I mentioned, uh, parents can often opt their children out. Um, for instance, the recent bill that passed in Illinois, uh, it mandates that if schools teach comprehensive sex ed, then they, or sorry, if schools teach sex ed, it must be comprehensive. However, the schools themselves can actually opt out as well. Um, and th I mean, this is kind of a silly thing because you would, in no other realm of learning, do parents have this much power except maybe with evolution, which is a similar thing. Um, you know, like imagine a parent just being like, I don't want my kid to learn about the Civil War. I'm going to take them out of history class for the two weeks when you're covering the Civil War because I don't think that's an appropriate topic for children. I don't, I would hope that that would never fly. Um, and unfortunately, the, the huge problem with this is that the parents that are the most likely to opt their children out of sex ed are also the parents that are the most likely to be teaching harmful information to them in the home or avoiding the topic altogether because they're trying to shelter their kids. That means that their kids are going to learn about sex from their friends who are similarly missing informed or from the internet, uh, which is often not good. It also, it still leaves out a lot of stuff. Um, it doesn't really focus on the whole open communication thing. It doesn't often uh, cover LGBTQ issues. Um, and although it does leave out less important information than abstinence only. The final problem with it is that its focus is absolutely on reducing sexual behavior. Um, and at first this might not seem like such a bad thing, but they kind of 
of have this view that, like, well, I guess kids are going to do it, so we might as well teach them how to do it safely, I guess. Um, and that's not really such a healthy thing to be teaching because it obscures the fact that, you know, sexual pleasure is a thing and it's a, it's a good part of life. Um, so, you know, I, I, I do think that's better than teaching that sex itself is evil, but it kind of treats sex education as a necessary evil. So, what would a better alternative look like? Well, nobody asked me, but I will tell you anyway. First of all, oh, I thank you for asking. Let me tell you. This is Miri's ideal sex education program. The most important feature of it is consent, because without that, don't even bother. I think that any sex education program should emphasize consent first and foremost, because without that, you can't have healthy sex. Um, what's right or wrong when it comes to sex should be based on what's consensual and what isn't, not on what we've decided as a society is appropriate and what isn't, and not on what religious books say is right and what isn't. It should teach uh, full information about safer sex, so that it also includes the less obvious stuff like IUDs, female condoms, and dental dams. It should teach teens how to make decisions about what sort of uh, contraception they're going to use based on their own needs, and that involves giving them all of the options, not just condoms or abstinence. It should emphasize communication and healthy relationships, so how to negotiate sex and relationships, how to know when to end the relationship, and so on. It should teach LGBTQ issues because even straight and gender people should know about them. It should teach that being queer isn't some, isn't merely something to tolerate, but something to actually respect and affirm and accept about people. It should teach about homophobia and transphobia and how to fight them. It should teach how to support a friend or a partner who comes out to you as LGBTQ. And whereas most sex ed programs assume that everyone wants sex and everyone's going to do it, in fact, some people are asexual and it's also okay. Um, and a teacher should remind students that just as wanting sex or romance is okay, not wanting sex or romance is also okay. And now I'm being truly unrealistic, but I think that sex ed programs should teach about alternative relationship styles. If you want to have multiple partners with everyone's consent, that's fine. And also, if you don't ever want to get married, that's also absolutely fine. And you shouldn't have to then never have sex until you get married, which you're not going to. <laughs> Most importantly, though, programs should teach teens to be skeptical of what they hear about sex um, from the media, from their friends, and also even from adults. Um, school in general, I think, should teach kids how to think for themselves, but with sex especially, this is important because there's so many myths floating around. And I think even more important than teaching the actual information is teaching people how to think critically about the information that they're receiving. So what can you do about sex ed? What can you do to help promote more evidence-based, less religion-based sex ed? First of all, support state legislation. This is very much a state issue. Um, different states, as you saw with the North Carolina and Tennessee examples, can absolutely vary on what they teach. Um, you should, you know, keep up to date on what's going on in your state. You can contact your legislators and so on. You should educate yourself and others. Um, I'm sure everyone in here is very, very well informed, but there are probably myths that you picked up in high school or elsewhere that are not true. So you should educate yourself, and you shouldn't hesitate to call out other people who are saying stuff like, she can't get pregnant if she's on top, or, you know, I have heard that. Um, you know, or, you know. Um, and yes, you, you, you uh, can actually spread STIs through oral sex, so you should consider using barriers when you do that. I don't think that many of us have children in here, but if you ever do, um, get involved in their sex education. And that means teach them yourself, teach them a skeptical, critical view of sex, um, and also get involved in what's going on at their school. I think a lot of schools assume that parents are... Sorry? Yes, exactly, and I will cover a few resources at the end that you can get to kids. Um, I think a lot of schools assume that parents are terrified of children learning about sex, and so some schools would just not have any sex ed. For instance, after elementary school, after that awful experience, I didn't really have anything ever again. Um, in fact, I think it would be good to model that some parents think that it's good and appropriate for their kids to learn about sex. So, you know, talk to your kids' teachers, talk to the principal, superintendents. Why should you care about this stuff? I think most of us are out of high school now, so it's not an immediate concern. Um, but I would argue that it still is. 
for all of us in immediate concern. First of all, um, just from a public health perspective, sex education is a public health issue. Anyone who's sexually active may be harmed by people who learn all this inaccurate information about sex. And all of us hopefully want the people in our communities to be healthy and to be able to choose when they have children. It's also an issue of church-state separation. Uh, the rhetoric of abstinence-only sex education is at times overtly religious, at times a little less so. Regardless, it's not based on evidence, and it does not belong in public schools. It certainly shouldn't be funded by the federal government. I think we can also all agree that education should be effective and use best practices. The research is rapidly piling up, showing that abstinence-only education simply doesn't do anything or actively harms. Why should we accept education that doesn't work? But finally, abstinence only has harmful sociocultural implications. Um, it's some of the myths that I discussed earlier, you know, and unfortunately a full explanation that is beyond the scope of this talk, but the national version is that abstinence only minimizes, minimizes the importance of consent, emphasizes traditional gender roles, promotes the myth that all men want to get sex and all women should avoid getting sex, and it holds up monogamous marriage to a standard that it just cannot live up to. The upshot is this, we cannot live in a secular society without secular sex education. If you want to learn more, these are a bunch of uh, these are a bunch of resources. You don't have to write them down because this is all online. And if you want to contact me for any reason, this is my blog, my email address, my Twitter handle, and my Tumblr, which is super cool. And here are my references. Thank you very much. I hardly endorse that. I've heard of it as well. James? Uh, I love this book. I wonder what you think. I was going to see this question I was going to talk about the book. I kind of think it's an interesting question for sex education. So I wish you could speak on this. I know that the answer on your list. And I wonder if people, I'm not kidding. I think yeah. we, should, we should tell people how to do it sex life, not just the place. And I wonder what you think about it. I actually agree with that. Um, I really do. I think it would be a lot harder to encourage something like that than the stuff that I did talk about, which is why I didn't include it. Um, but I support that uh, wholeheartedly. That's also what we teach in our um, college sex purification program. Anyone else? Do you mean people who have already gone through abstinence only programs and are now, and now you're trying to? I think maybe most people my age and under have went through abstinence only programs. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I mean, that's, that's basically what I did in my, um, in my peer education program. Um, and it involved a lot of myth busting. Um, one thing that we do is we often actually ask people, we'll ask them, like, we do this exercise called a continuum where on one side of the board we'll put agree, and then on the other side we'll put disagree. And then we ask them, you know, do you think that sex should only be within marriage? Or, you know, is it possible to have casual sex without falling in love? And then, you know, people stand wherever along the line that they, uh, that they believe. Um, and this is a really useful exercise because it exposes uh, students to, like, the full kind of range of opinions that are in the room. And then you ask different people, why did you choose to stand there? And then it, it just exposes them to different opinions, and it doesn't involve having to actually tell them, like, oh, you're wrong. You know, I do think that if someone spouts off some, you know, oxytocin crap, I think it's totally legit to say, actually, the research doesn't really show that. Uh, but otherwise, getting people talking and just exposing them to other people's opinions, I think, is a really useful tool. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh.